Um, take me back for you for that era, man, because you're a little older than I am. So um, you was you kind of you know being on the scene and being in the in the music. I didn't start getting into the music business till '93, so you got a little bit of familiarity with that era than I do from a from an industry standpoint. Oh yeah, I mean my first record at '86, right? So, but I was b-boying and doing all that stuff before that but i'll take you through uh, 87 87 since you mentioned 87 all right so walk down the block you see a flyer oh the milky way right there's a lot of clubs the clubs used to have a night which was like a hip-hop night and they would call it whatever they called it which wasn't the name of the club like irving plaza which is on irving plaza in manhattan was known as the milky way it was known as the world it was known as a bunch right. of different depending on which promoter rocked it, right? Right. So you see a fly for the Milky Way. It's like, oh, but the Milky Way also used to be at this spot on Suffolk Street. You know, they'd move, right? Right. So <laughs> like, I right, ain't that much money. I go here, you know, or first class in the Bronx. That was like a spot on near 138th and Grand Concourse. You know, back, let me start at 138th Grand Concourse, 86. I walk in there, not even technically old enough to be in there because it just changed the legal drinking age to 21. Just missed out on 18. I was pissed. <laughs> so I walked in there, but I, I was allowed in because I was a B-boy. And they had a big wall separating these two huge rooms. I ended up battling these cats who would later go on to be known as UTFO because they were dancers first, right? And then they had two graffiti writers battling each other. On the wall in the club, they're doing pieces, Bio and Brim. Uh, Bio being from the Tats crew, the crew that Fat Joe's down with, right? right. They're writing graffitis on the wall. Africa Islam is spinning. Right. Wow. So, yeah. So and this was regular. Right. You know, we rock till about maybe four in the morning, then walk up the block to 138th and grab yourself a hot pastrami and cheese sandwich and a yoohoo for going back to the crib because I was the only bodega I opened 24 hours. Right. right. So that was the thing. Right. That's the kind of thing. Or we go to skate key, which was a skating roller skating rink. But then at the end of the night, they let you take the skates off and you could dance. So we battle cats there. Moved to Long Island, a lot of roller skating rinks, Levittown Roller Rink, right? Um, there was a, a subway, which was in Hempstead, right? Hempstead is where Public Enemy had their studios. Uh, these things all existed. There was a lot of outlets, right? Because, you know, they were trying to slowly build up hip hop. Matter of fact, on Long Island, cats weren't even really playing hip hop in clubs. And to Charlie Brown's older brother, who was my introduction to Brown, his brother Hig, who was one of my mentors, he started little by little playing more and more and more hip hop at these clubs. And he's bought, he bought the hip hop really to Long Island in that respect because a lot of those were mob run clubs. They wasn't trying to have black people in the club. Right, no doubt. And he was black and he was little, he played a hip hop record that was commercial enough, like maybe a Run DMC record. And then he pushed it and he pushed it. And before you know, there's an hour worth of hip hop. And before you know, there was half the night was hip hop. And, right. and he was like really responsible for that, like for real. So those little things you can see you can, now in hindsight, you can see how incremental the growth was. But I would go to mad different spots. You know, we go to, go to, um, a spot you see like a guest DJ spot by cut creator or something like that. And then you hear a cat like Duke of Denmark, who you probably don't even know, but this dude used to kill the set in Manhattan like that. And then, you know, so there was always after hour spots, you know, people that you didn't realize worked with other people. Like Kane was Roxanne Shantae's DJ. Right. Right. So I was the, I was the DJ. I was the, the, the house DJ for, the world at Urban Plaza and Kid and Play and Shantae came to perform. Shantae opened up for Kid and Play and Kane didn't have his records because I guess he was riding the train and somebody took him. You know, he was sleeping <laughs> or something like, you know, he just, I mean, it wasn't like somebody robbed him like while he was awake. Like, yeah, I guess he crashed and somebody just yacked his bag, right? So he gets to the spot and like, yo, I, you know, you got, any, you, and you got any Shantae records? I'm like, of course I got Shantae records. He's like, I'm gonna need them. I'm like, all right. He got on and he spun for Shantae and he killed it. And then he's like, yo, I got a single. If I come back next week, would you play it? I'm like, yeah, all right. He brings me raw. So right. I'm like, <laughs> I put it in my headphones. I'm like, you know, I don't know. I got here first. It might be whack. Right. You know, right. You know what I'm saying? I throw it right. out. I'm like, so I went crazy. I'm like, yo. And back in those days, you could play a record that was unknown. And people, if they liked it, they would dance to it. Now they got to hear it a thousand times on the radio before they accept it. Facts. Yeah, I mean, I asked you that, man, because I came in 
the second wave. I came through the um, what would be the underground golden era, right? So right. I came around 98, 99, you know, where I really started rhyming in 93, but the Wake Up Show hit and I was on the Wake Up Show in 94. And then, but the the, the my class of, of MCs were Dilated Peoples and Jurassic Five and uh, that whole raucous movement, right? So Talib and Most Def and um, I came from that era and it was the second wave. So the same experience you had in 87, I would have in 94, like you go to club unity, with my man, bigger B rest in peace. Yep. And you get cats like Mark Love DJing or J rock or Rhythmatic or Kilo. And you get all yep. these dudes or you go to the fat beats and you get to see CeeLos and all these different dudes that, you know, end up being these, you know, these hip hop giants, but you didn't know it then. Right. And so I was taking that to the wake up show to the beat, which was a major radio station in L.A. at the time. No, I, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I'm taking that tapes, bro. And so and they playing that. And this is when Sway is he ain't Sway, he, not the Sway now, but the Sway then. Yeah, check and Sway it was just taking sway, you know what I'm saying? Before they had DJ Revolution spinning, they had, you know, right. a, a couple different cats. But um, so what what I, I feel bad for, for the younger generation now is they don't have those outlets that we had, right? Like we had, like you had the outlets you had, and I had the outlets I had. Like college radio was huge. We should go on college radio tours across the country. You know what I'm saying? And so now it's just try to get it on Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. And you good to go. But, you, you know, you this was an opportunity for us to kind of really meet, you know what I'm saying? Like, and share stories, right? I remember going on my first tour with the Licks and the Beat Nuts, and I'm sitting in the room with Psycho Less and Juju and j Ro and, and E. Swift and Tash, and we I, these are my childhood idols that I'm getting to swap war stories with, you know what I'm saying? And so, like, that was a vital piece for me for, as far as hip-hop is concerned, man. And I know, like, you probably don't call yourself a historian, man, but you was there at the epicenter of it all, man. So that's why I appreciate you coming through, man. Let me ask you this, man, really quick. What advice would you give your 17-year-old self, man? My 17-year-old self? Hmm, that's a good question. When I was 17, um, what was I doing when I was 17? Oh, yeah. I already made three albums. And um, and they did well. One of them was Yo Bum Rush the Show. I worked with the Beastie Boys. I did the Kings of Pressure stuff. True Mathematics. Um, I you did True Mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what? It's funny, man. I forgot a lot of the stuff I did, <laughs> but um, because right. because you just did it. You know, things came through. You did it. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I ended up going to the military after being with PE for a while. And, okay. and, I was, and I was stationed on the West Coast. I was in Vallejo for a while. I was in San Diego. Okay. Um, so I was a Cali dude for a minute. Matter of fact, my two oldest daughters were born in San Diego. No word. Okay. Right. I didn't know that. So, I thought you went to. I thought you went to the service before PE. Nah, I went after the first two albums. There was some, you know, paperwork and logistical issues that I had with them. So Which I left. I'm quite like, typical in the music business, though. Right. <laughs> and, and, and um, and I left. I'm like, you know what, peace. I left and I went and got my degree, my computer science, electrical engineering degree, came back, you know, and everybody said the same thing. You leave it, you're going to mess up. And I came back and I just picked up where I left off. I mean, it's what it is, you know. Right. I actually picked up a lot of skills while I was gone. Um, and a little bit of trauma. <laughs> right, for sure. But, um, <laughs> but um, the thing, I don't know, you know, um, maybe maybe be more patient. Right. You know, um, we have a habit in the hood when we see something and we think that's it, we will go to grab it like right away. Right. Because because we like, yo, we got to get that. I got to get mine. And that's opportunity. I got to grab it. But not all opportunities are there for you to grab. You know, sometimes you got to let those slide away. Right. No yeah. doubt. I would I would definitely tell myself the same, man. I know at 17, I was a senior in high school. That was 1993, 92, 93. And um, I was like you know, getting ready to co go to college and, you know, I wasn't even rhyming yet. You know what I'm saying? So that wasn't even in the cars for me at the time. I mean, I was, I was DJing. I DJ first. I started DJing in, in, in junior high school. Right. So it's a funny story how I started DJing and my neighbor, uh, Greg Ford, he was real good friends with, um, with uh, general Jeff 
You know what oh, I'm saying? Oh, Matt Jones. <laughs> yeah, rest in peace. So, um, yeah, no doubt, so that's man. that's how I learned how to how to um how to DJ it was through him. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, he was over there on the weekends. I'd be there watching them dudes, man, asking my dad to go buy me a realistic mixer like he had and all that, man. So, um, but I would tell myself the same, man. Be be patient. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of opportunities that I thought, you know, I was going to be something in the music business, man, never really panned out. But I'm not mad that they didn't. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I don't think I'd be where I'm at today and had a life that I have now. And it had it not been for some of those setbacks or what I thought was setbacks back then. You know, exactly. Right. And the thing is, you don't have at that age, you don't really have the context, right? And the perspective that you would need to identify what exactly might be best for you at the time because you're thirsty, you know, it's like, oh man, what? That's why people sign these record deals as young men, young women, and they get jerked because they're like, yo, you know, I might never get a chance to sign a record deal ever. I got to sign this one. Right. And that record deal is full of, you know, whatever. I mean, my record deal was fine. I took it to a lawyer and all that. I didn't get jerked because of my 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 contract was whack. I got jerked because the dudes that that made the contract with me violated the contract. So, right. you know, yeah, you that was that was the thing that Russell Simmons told me, man. When I met him, trying to get signed at Def Jam back in '04, he was like, "I don't want to sign you, bro. You know too much. This is the record business, not the artist business, right?" And yeah. so. I remember him saying that and walking away feeling mad because I thought he was one of my heroes, right? That was the realest advice I could have ever gotten in the music business, right? And I was like, yeah, you know what? Let me figure this shit out. He was like, you don't need me, bro. Like, you could be me. Like, you already got what it takes. You just got to put your shit out there. You know what I'm saying? So that really gave me the, you know, the stones to really go out there and do it on my own. And I've been I've been independent ever since then. You know what I'm saying? So... Um, yeah, you've been doing a great job, man. I, I I really admire, you know, the track that uh, that you've taken, you know, and the path you've walked. And, you know, I, I think people define success differently. Right. So one of the things I probably even ask myself is, you know, think very carefully about this. What do you perceive as success? Because when we're young, we tend to define success by what our peers think it is, right? Right. And it's, Oh, where's your car? Where's that fly crib or wh whatever it is, you know, and then you start getting, you know, wrapped up in that whole, you know, peer pressure mentality where you feel like you need to show your success. This is why cats like Bill Gates, who owns half the planet, walks around in a pair of khaki pants and a pair right, of like skaters. Right. And then, you know, and you got some dude that barely made a little money and he's rocking $500 sneakers and a $70 belt. It's like... Right. Why do we feel the need to show the next person how you know, look look how successful I am? Because look what I have. Right. You know, th that that quiet confidence you have from you know from from really having a lot of self-love is what's missing from the hood. So what happens is we feel the need to impress people around us because we we get a false sense of love. Because the word love is also distorted, right? So right. you know, my hood shows me love. What does that mean? Is right. that real love when no. they're showing you respect because they think you got something they want. Yeah, so that. <laughs> that's it right there. Right oh, when you're a kid, you don't know that. Right. Love is a verb, man. I tell I tell my students that all the time, man. Love is a verb, man. And not everybody knows how to do it. Right. Like we who, who taught you how to love, right? You just you emulate what you think love is based on the perception of what you think love is. Right. And so until somebody actually shows you what that looks like, feels like. You really don't know. You know what I'm saying? And so you, you write a lot of cats walk around. Like I remember when I first started in business, man, I had a whole bunch of friends, man. Now my circle is tight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And everybody like, cause it, it got to the point to where like, man, you wasn't in the gym with me when I was shooting them jumpers, man. So you can't, I'm not giving you tickets to the game. You know what I'm saying? Just cause now we winning. Right. So it's a, uh, it's one of them things, man. So let me ask you this lastly, bro. Um, if you could work with any artist, dead or alive, who would it be? That's another good question. Because I've worked with a lot of very big artists. Right. So, I'm, and I'm talking about not hip-hop. I'm talking about outside of hip-hop. Yeah, I know I know your discography, man. So, so I, I get it. this is why I wanted to ask you this question. I usually ask five people dead or alive who you want to have dinner with. But who's top five dead or alive artists you would want to work with? Sammy Davis Jr. Dope. Um, I would have loved to put together 
a soundtrack to a Richard Pryor um, project. I don't know what it would have been, right? But it was 